god. Insight to the darkness of the human mind. Can't just throw things away. What you did to people, it's always there, out there, waiting for you in the dark. It does come home on you. It comes home on your clothes. It comes home in your head. What's wrong with her? They were two people who together created an uncontrollable compulsion in themselves. Do you love me? Do you love me? It's interesting to see the journey that took her to this disconnection from humanity. Has anybody ever loved you that much to that do it? To kill or die for you. About five years ago, um, a friend of mine shared a book with me called The Encyclopedia of Crime. And in that book, I came across this story that my grandfather was directly linked to. He uh, had been one of the police officers directly vested in the capture, extradition, and execution of the Lonely Hearts killers, Raymond Fernandez and Martha Jewel Beck. When I met uh, Todd Robinson for the first time, he told me that he is the grandson of Buster Robinson. And this was one of the things that really intrigued me into it because it was a true story. Todd was able to bring so much more into this character than, you know, because of the relationship, because this is a man that he himself knew. Todd basically uh, only had me in mind. I guess my presence or essence was what he thought of as his grandfathers that he'd seen in other movies. And... Cops don't talk about what they see. They push it down with a stiff promo on a bourbon back, hide behind a newspaper and hope nobody notices. Homicide detectives see the darkest things that you can possibly imagine. They can't bring that home and share that with their children or their wives, even today. What was personal about this story was how not only this case, but many, many of the homicides he worked on affected him personally, affected my father, my grandmother. People don't just punch out for no reason. Yeah, well, she had a reason. Uh, I was talking about Annie. Yeah, I know. Well, the thing is, is that I don't know if my character always cared so deeply about these particular victims. I think that because he was trying to figure out why his wife died or committed suicide, he's um, suddenly trying to make up for the past. Well, I, th I think he's working out some of his own personal issues through his job. And I'll go along with it as long as it's helping him. He can get lost in certain things, and I just try to pull him back, that's all. Remember what you told me when I made detective? Hmm? You said, do the job. Make sure you go home. Don't tell your wife nothing, and keep the blood out here. And he's accusing me of, of putting my heart on the line or my humanity in the job and on the job, which is kind of the cardinal rule that you don't do as a police officer you or a detective. You, you don't get emotionally involved. But for both our sakes, don't make it personal. Do it right. Act like a cop. The big thing about those two actors, John Travolta and James Gandolfini, is, is, is the great chemistry that those two have. I was fond of Jim from the moment I met him. Uh, on the set of Get Shorty, and I was hoping that we would continue to do films together. John and I grew up 10 minutes away from each other. Um, my father used to buy tires from John's father. I, I just saw a picture of him in his father's store, and he said, yeah, that's my son. And I was uh, pretty impressed. And, you know, he came from uh, my neighborhood, so to speak, so if he could do it, you know, others could do it. That's <laughs> fun. They have great fun together. They needle each other. And so what starts to happen uh, from a filmmaker's point of view is you, you stop hearing the words and you start watching two human beings communicate beyond anything that a writer wrote. And that's when a film starts to take on a life of its own. This homicide thing, it's all in your head. It's fiction. It's a zero. Really? Yeah. Yeah, the was McSwain all over it. And if I'm so screwed up, why they got you on it, huh? I think that question answers itself. It's hard to say whose voodoo was working on who, but the day them two figured each other out 
was the beginning of a bad end for a lot of people. We talked about early on, um, Todd and I, that there was a, kind of a super ray and dark ray, you know, light ray, dark ray. And a lot of that is, you know, you can find an indication of that in the film is when I'm wearing the toupee, I'm kind of covering up and had become this person I've always wanted to be, you know, who is uh, quick to smile and has a, a way with women and words. Roby, I'm so sorry I'm late. A thousand apologies. So he enjoys the transformation. He enjoys the approval and the power. It's a special day. the person under that who's full of a lot of pain and antisocial and um, really has a hard time relating to people. Extraordinary to see Jared's physical transformation. I forget, it's him. There's just, there's a whole physical side as well as with the hair and shaving and it's a lot of plucking of the hair out of the head, um, which takes many hours every day of with tweezers and uh that's not fun when he meets martha everything changes because she offers him one thing that no one else has ever offered him, and that's unconditional love twisted and as bizarre as it is the fact that he knows she realizes who he is and she still loves him for who he is frees him doesn't matter what each of them do they still stick together. Who knows you, Raymond? Who takes care of you? Martha. Who wants you like you are? The problem comes with the fact that he still has to do his job to support and sustain the two of them. And Martha is observing this and is just filled with great rage and jealousy and anger. Don't you ever love them? Something happened when they met. When they met, it was like those two elements together uh, created a poison. It's taken to such an extreme, to the point where she justifies killing. He kills for me. That's how much he loves me. Very disturbing. What they do, what they're capable of doing is very disturbing. These are not attractive people that they're playing. Uh, they're the worst that society offers. And uh, yet, they're, they're giving an interpretation that's worth looking at. I'm just gonna have to go places I've, I've never been, and, and some of them a little bit scary, but nonetheless part of humanity and, and, and interesting. <laughs> Son of a <laughs> bitch, you call it for his name! But it's, it's very taxing. It's emotionally and physically draining, and that's one of the, the blessings about the part, is that it really is a chance to go someplace that, uh, you're not asked to go very often. Who do you love? <laughs> that commitment personally means a lot to me because it's such a difficult work to do. Oh, God, Martha. You made such a mess. The great challenge of a period movie is that every shot is a scene. Every actor has to be in period wardrobe. The details have to be right. Every set light fixtures, switches, everything. It's beautiful. I mean, the wardrobe is spectacular. The wardrobe, the makeup and hair of this, they all have an incredibly difficult job and are doing it tremendously. The movie really sets you there. I mean, just walking into the sets and the light and the costumes, it really transports you to that era. The different movie departments did an excellent job at capturing the reality of the of the time so the planes are correct for the era uh, the cars are correct for the era the wardrobe is correct for the era the hair and makeup is and I'm a stickler for all that so uh, but fortunately everyone else is it's always difficult making a movie and it's difficult under these conditions and I think they've done an incredible job I mean I feel in the time period very much when I'm working so the time period when I walk for example on the set at the uh, at the police station, I thought I'd walk back into 60 years in time. I, I even suggested they should keep it as a museum and charge admission fee. You know, I don't know why she left us, Eddie. I mean, I, I could understand why she'd leave me, but... 
you know this is a man who not unlike his victims is completely cut off from his family completely cut off from his friends any kind of support system you know you're all alone and i know how that feels it burns on your skin i think the title says a lot I and mean, they're all lonely hearts and people that are just searching for love and some people have a unhealthy way of doing that makes you feel a really bad pain right on your stomach and you can't breathe well how far would someone go for what they think is love you feel like you're in a dark room and that the walls are coming down on you there is this sort of counterpoint this this parallel between the victims the killers and the pursuers no can come and save you that's part of what makes it interesting as a as a subject for a story you know how do you contend with these things how do you process them and how do you get on with your life and survive you feel lonely <laughs>